The Corporation, Lecture Three. Okay, let's get started. Good afternoon, everybody. My sense is I'm way behind. <laughs> Just generally, so uh, uh, we'll we'll speed through some of the issues. I think we've some of the things in outline uh, we've uh, we've to a large extent already already discussed, and uh, the, there's some things I really do want to talk about, and other things that I think are more optional. So so we'll go through. Uh, Try to wrap everything up uh, today. Um, last time we talked about uh, one of the essential um, critiques of the modern, corpor modern corporation. I would argue uh, maybe the most legitimate of all of them, in the sense that uh, you know this is this is the criticism uh, presented by by legal scholars and finance professors, and this idea is of ownership, the separation of ownership control, the idea that shareholders. Um, the shareholders don't have control over the corporation, and therefore managers can get away with stuff. They can, uh, you know, act as as presented uh, as presented in the literature. They can act in their own self-interest, which is not consistent with the self-interest of shareholders. And my argument was that, given if both parties are rational, there is no conflict between the two self-interests. There is no conflict between the interest, the true interest, of the CEO and the interests of shareholders, that their interests are aligned if they are both rational. And the question, the question arises, well, what if the CEO is not completely rational? And there are certainly examples of that. Are there ways in which the market can help make sure that that CEO does not misbehave, if you will? Are there mechanisms by which we can align the interest when they do get out of whack, when the CEO is interested in doing stuff that the, that the, that the shareholders wouldn't otherwise be interested. For example, you know, uh, reducing his risk by diversification when it's not necessarily in the best interest of shareholders to do that, or taking on a huge, huge salary when you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's not commensurate with his abilities and with his uh, level of productivity. What can the market do to make sure that those things don't happen? And one of the things we mentioned last time was, well, if you have a board of directors that truly represents the interest of shareholders, then that's their job. Their job is to make sure that the CEO does not misbehave, we'll call it, does stick to maximizing shareholder wealth, does stick to the mission of, does stick to that alignment of interests. And the most, the best shareholders, from my perspective, would be, the, I mean, the best board members would be shareholders. Because then you've got a clear alignment of interest, right? If the board owns stock, what's their incentive? Well, it's to maximize the value of shares, which is the same incentive, same interest as do uh, the shareholders. And we talked about last time how many regulatory barriers there are in the United States to block holders getting established, taking significant chunks of a stock in a company, and second, to then being represented on the board. And there actually, as we, we discussed, there are actually regulations, laws in place that restrict the ability of bankers and insurance and insurers and pension funds and, uh, and mutual funds for sitting on boards and for even taking bankers, for even taking large positions in uh, industrial companies and non-bank companies. Okay. So uh, regulation has eliminated a whole market mechanism, if you will, from from existence in terms of monitoring managers and making sure that that alignment happens. Yeah. So if large shareholders are not ending up on boards, who is ending up on boards? Okay, and so who is ending up on boards? And the idea here is, particularly today, particularly post Sarbanes, and really I'd say over the last 15 years there's been a real push for this, is the idea that we need on a board of directors independent directors, and I'm putting that in quotes, independent directors. We need directors that are not affiliated with the CEO. That's their independence. They're supposed to be independent of the CEO. And we know that if we put on the board of directors business associates, they might have a relationship with the CEO, right? Because they're all in business, so they're all in the same country clubs, and they all, you know, they golf together and stuff. So we don't want business people on there, right? And if we put shareholders on the board of directors, if we put large shareholders like Warren Buffett, for example, then he's not completely independent because he's a shareholder, therefore, and the CEO is a shareholder. And, you know, he's somehow, 
he now has an interest. What is his interest? Maximizing shareholder wealth. But that's an interest for these people, for these people advocating for independence. So who would be an ideal independent director? Well, politicians, former politicians. Note Al Gore is making a fortune, put aside his movie, by being a board member on a number of boards. Unfortunately, for those of us who love the Macintosh, he's on the board of Apple Computer. Um, so politicians, former politicians, uh, lawyers, and, and we'll talk about the kind of environment that creates on a board when you have lots of lawyers on a board. Uh, college professors, former deans, but not businessmen. <laughs> Not, certainly not bankers. You know, maybe today you need accountants to, to be on the audit committee. Okay. But, but retired naval officers, that would be good. <laughs> but the principle is this. We want people who are literally independent of business. We want people who don't have a selfish interest in maximizing shareholder wealth because the real agenda behind board reform as it's being advocated is not to maximize shareholder wealth, but to represent stakeholders and get stakeholder theory into the board of directors. All done in the name of aligning the interest of shareholders and managers by providing independent directors. And why is it that uh, Warren Buffett is not acceptable as a director, but Al Gore is acceptable as a director, particularly if he owns no stock in the company. The reason is altruism. Al Gore has no selfish interest in monitoring the CEO and making sure that the interests are aligned and making sure he's doing it out of a sense of duty, out of a sense of love for the shareholders or love of the world. You know, it's the same, it's the same idea of why we have a Federal Reserve. Why is it that we distrusted J.P. Morgan to run, you know, the equivalent of the Federal Reserve was accused, but, to, but we trust Alan Greenspan? Because Alan Greenspan has no selfish interest in the outcome, <laughs> right? He's doing it, what do we call those people? Public servants, right? They're doing it for the good of the country. That is something that we, are, you know, as a culture, have been trained to think of as the good. But J.P. Morgan ran the banking system to the extent that he ran the banking system. Why? To make money. Warren Buffett sits on the board of directors to do what? To make money for Warren Buffett. Al Gore sits on the board of directors on the illusion that his interests are the interests of the country, the interests of the company, the interests of the shareholders. But we really know, you know that, that his agenda is to actually undercut all those interests, ultimately. Okay. So altruism today drives even the selection of directors who we as a culture uh, many people in the culture feel comfortable with is non-selfish people sitting on the board. People who don't have a selfish interest in the interest of it. That's what makes them independent. They don't have an interest. And it, it got to such an extreme that Juan Buffett, who was uh, on the board of Coca-Cola, had been on the board of Coca-Cola since New Coke. Do you remember New Coke? That was like 88, something like that. Uh, and he bought, he bought into Coca-Cola at the bottom. When that whole catastrophe happened, he bought a huge chunk of shares in Coca-Cola and rode it up and made a fortune of Coke sto stock and was on the board and was an incredibly valuable member on the board of directors uh, because not only does he know business, he's obviously an incredible, maybe the most accomplished investor of all time, but he had a clear interest in the success of Coca-Cola because he owned a big chunk of the stock. Uh, about two or three years ago, CalPERS, the big, the big uh, state pension fund, put pressure on Coca-Cola to get rid of Warren Buffett because he wasn't independent. I mean, that's, that's how it's moving. Now, he resisted and he's still on there. He'll be leaving. I think he's maybe has left already, but that's because he's slowing down because, because he's reached that age uh, and, and he's, he's leaving boards of directors. But there was huge pressure to get rid of him. So that's one way in which boards of directors could be a market solution to whatever problems might exist. And again, I believe these problems are relatively rare, but if they existed, boards of directors could be a solution. But they can't be, because indeed we've taken out those elements. Now, we're seeing a replacement of what the mutual fund, the bank, the insurance company, and the pension fund should be doing in, today, uh, in, in the new industry of hedge funds today. And you're seeing certain hedge funds devoted to taking large positions in companies where they think they can help improve the situation. 
and influence, trying to have a positive influence on the board of directors, and sometimes even taking over the whole company and replacing the board and replacing the CEO. I can think of one example of that, and that's Kmart and Sears. Um, uh, Eddie Lampert, who runs, I can't remember the name of the hedge fund, is today the chairman of the combination of, of Kmart and Sears, and he runs a hedge fund that basically specializes in what we used to call in the 1980s hostile takeovers. And we'll talk a little bit more in a minute about what hostile takeovers do and why, you know, how they help in this case as well. Okay. Okay. And we're seeing how kind of the, the, the cultural trend, including Sarbanes-Oxley, actual regulations, are moving us towards boards that, in my opinion, would create more problems than solutions. And I call these boards today, the, the, the movies, these are going to be compliance boards. They're not going to be boards that are going to help us align interests, help the CEO strategize about making the business a better business, how to maximize profitability, maximize shareholder wealth. Because they're not composed to do that. Lawyers and accountants and politicians have no clue how to do that. They have nothing to add. So a CEO who's struck with a, the, the, the real purpose of a board, one of the purposes other than monitoring, would be if a CEO has a problem, he can go to his board of directors filled with other businessmen and say, how would you deal with this marketing issue? Or how would you deal? I mean, it's a guidance. It's help. It's reviewing a strategic plan. But if you fill the board with all these independents, you, they're useless when it comes to these kind of things. But what are they good at? They're good at making sure you dot all the, T, you dot all the I's and cross all the T's in the audit committee when they, you know, when they do, when they audit the financial statements. They're making sure that you follow all the regulations to the T because they're accountants and lawyers and that's what they're good at. And they'll put constraints on the CEO and they'll limit him in his ability to do things because they'll follow the letter of the law in its most conservative form because, again, that's what accountants and lawyers are good at. Okay. So I see, I see this as, as, a, as a trend as boards becoming less and less effective and placing more and more constraints and acting more as compliance, making sure that the, as, as regulations become more complex, that the company follows regulations than is helping the company be more successful. Okay, what else, what other, um, what else in the marketplace? Um, aligns, if you will, helps align the interests of, uh, of management and shareholders. Well, ultimately, I'd say that the, the, it comes in, in, in three categories, if you will. The, the product market, the capital market, uh, and the market uh, for, for managers, uh, the managerial labor market. Uh, well, the product market is kind of kind of pretty basic. If, if, if all the manager is doing is lining his own pockets, if all the manager is doing is, is thinking about his big yard and the penthouse and so on, then he's not focused on running the company. The company's just not going to do well. It's ultimately going to go best. Now, that's not a very efficient solution. It's not a real efficient market solution to wait all the way until the, co the company goes bust. Now, let's say he really has the board in his pocket and there has to be, and that's the product market. That, that's what it means. It means that, you know, the products won't be good. They won't be competitive. The business won't be successful. And at that point, how would the capital markets kick in? What, what happens to a company who's not doing well, is not making money? Share price, Share price declines. Now, in what way is that helpful in aligning the interests of managers and the shareholders? Well, a number of things. A, if managers own stock, and if managers own stock options, <laughs> they're going to be less rich. So uh, it's going to hurt them. As the stock price declines, their net worth declines with it. Okay? And there's a lot of hype about managers don't own anything. It certainly was in the past a lot of hype about managers own very little. But as a percentage of their net worth... As a percentage of their net worth, most CEOs have a huge amount of their net worth tied in the stock and the stock option of their own companies. And when the stock declines, it hurts them significantly. Okay. Yeah. And it makes it right for a takeover. Yeah, so that's, that's the next one. Uh, but before I get to a takeover, there's another element of a stock price going down. What happens when a stock goes down to the cost of capital for the company? It goes up. It becomes more expensive to raise capital, whether through issuing new stock 
or even if you're going into the bond market. The bond market is not stupid. They can see the stock declining. That is a negative signal. That means increased risk. And that means the rates that you're going to get on your debt, if you want to borrow money, are going to be higher. The cost of capital goes up. So if, as we talked last time, one of the theories is that these managers, uh, in order to protect themselves, uh, need to buy and conglom could create these conglomerates, well, it's now becoming very expensive for them to go out and buy these unrelated businesses in order to protect themselves, you know, to reduce their own personal risk. And that affects them. If they want to grow the company, anything they want to do now becomes more expensive. And therefore hinders whatever, they, whatever actions they do want to take become much more difficult for them. Okay. Um, to the extent that a board might have been asleep, and, and you can see that, you know, things are going well, the board just doesn't pay much attention, a stock decline tends to wake them up. Because it wakes up the shareholders, and it, partially because if you have an even semi-healthy board, they own stock. Right? They might not own as much stock as, as if, you had, if you allowed the block holders, but they still own some stock. But also, shareholders get upset when the stock price declines, and they start putting pressure on the board. So stock price declining wakes the board up, and the board becomes alert. And you know, if it has to, it replaces the CEO. At the, very, at the very least, it slaps the wrist of the CEO and wakes the CEO up and says, you can't continue to do this. we got to do something different. So the capital markets, one of the great virtues, and, and this isn't a course on the stock market, but one of the great, most important things about stock markets is the signals they send to the company itself. Rational stock prices, rational values, are indications to the company about things are going, about, you know, a, a, a feedback mechanism about how things are going. And if a stock price decline says, wait a minute, what's going on? What does the market see that I don't see? That's how a board would look at the stock. Um, can you connect that point with um, an argument I sometimes hear that companies are too focused on the short term value of the stock and kind of maximize the threat towards the Let me get to that. I, I mean, that's something I want to talk about. Um, okay. And of course, if a stock price declines, which is the point made earlier, it makes it cheaper for somebody to buy. Uh, and that somebody uh, could be what, it, what we call today, hot, hot, or we used to call hostile takeovers. Uh, they're not so, hostile takeovers aren't sexy anymore, or, or really regulatorily uh, not, 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 uh, not approved anymore. Uh, but basically think about, think about an ideal uh, market uh, with no regulations. Uh, stock price declines. I can go in there, and I, and I believe that with different management, I, the stock price has declined because the manager is padding his pockets or whatever. Stock price has declined. He's not paying attention to the, to the business. I can buy up the stock, put in somebody who will be motivated to pay attention, and the stock price will rise. I can then sell it and make, make a profit. And in a truly free market, I could probably go in there and buy 51% of the stock without anybody knowing or without announcing it to the world like we do have to do today. Walk into the CEO's office, theoretically, fire him, replace him, and move on. You know. uh, and indeed, that is what, not exactly that way, but that is what happened uh, in much of the 1980s. Uh, in the 1980s, I think the case was that because of a lot of things, because of the inflation of the 1970s, because of uh, regulation, because of competition from uh, Japan and from, uh, from Europe, uh, a lot of American businesses were not doing well going into the 1980s. And stock prices were low. As we said, the Dow Jones Industrial was, was about 800 uh, in 1982. And many people saw opportunity there. They saw opportunities to buy businesses relatively cheap, replace the management, focus the business, uh, incentivize the managers to really make money, uh, take on leverage. You know, uh, the story is in, in, in one of the... Um, one of the ideas behind uh, leverage takeovers is that you load up managers with debt, right? So that most of the cash flow coming out of the business has to pay the debt. And if they don't work really, really hard to make that cash flow, then they're going to go bust and they're going to lose the shares that they have. So it focuses managers on working really, really hard to pay off that debt. And once they pay off the debt, what's the value of their equity? If they got just a little bit of shares in the beginning because of leverage, it is huge. So leverage buyouts, are, are one way to look at leverage buyouts is a way to incentivize managers to turn over on companies and, and in, in, uh, in a very intense, uh, 
you know, it'd get them to work really amazing hours, which, which uh, if you read some of the stories of the turnarounds in the 1980s, they, they clearly did. But hostile takeovers was a way in which to replace the management when management was no good for a variety of different reasons with better management. And the freer the market, the easier hostile takeovers would be. And indeed, I believe that one of the reasons we had such a healthy corporate market in the 1990s was because of the takeovers of the 1980s. So in the 1980s, not only did many inefficient businesses in America get taken over and made efficient, but managers of inefficient businesses who didn't want to lose their job noticed that other companies were being taken over, didn't want to lose their jobs, and therefore brought about the increased efficiencies in their own companies. Okay. And that's why I view people like Michael Milken and many of those corporate raiders as heroes. They made all that transition possible. And the companies, if you look at American corporations coming into the 1980s, many of them were conglomerates. Uh, many of them were running some very efficient businesses, but others not. They weren't spinning the non-efficient ones off. They, they weren't willing to lay people off. Uh, they, they were practicing, or at least some of them were practicing, some of the stakeholder stuff. And indeed, the 1980s was a... I think a resurrection of this idea of shareholder wealth maximization, of a refocus on shareholders, on making money. Uh, and, and it was an, ultimately, it turned out to be an incredibly healthy period of fixing stuff that needed fixing. So, what did we do? What did our politicians do? Is they basically, in a variety of different forms, banned or restricted dramatically the ability to do hostile takeovers. So we have several, at the state level, several states, I think well over half the states in the United States have anti-takeover provisions in those states. Typically brought about by, how do, anybody know how these are typically brought about? Well, the first one was in uh, Pennsylvania, and it was brought about when a, when a Pennsylvania company got a hostile takeover bid. Somebody wanted to buy them out, and it was clear that as a consequence of that, some of the plants in Pennsylvania were going to be shut down and moved to cheaper places. The company ran to the legislature, this is pragmatist, businessmen who are pragmatists, ran to the legislature, and they, in emergency sessions, passed an anti-takeover legislation that made that bill impossible. A similar thing happened in Nevada. Uh, similar things have happened, and again, over, 50, uh, uh, over half of the states in the United States have them. In addition, courts have upheld things like poison pills and other mechanisms by which management, through, I think, gimmicks, can, can basically completely thwart a, a hostile takeover if they want to do so. Compare that to pre-1968, when you could literally buy up enough shares of a company to have to basically take control of it without even announcing it. Today, if you get 5% of a stock, you have to fire. If you have 10% of a stock, you have to find a uh, 13G, I think it is, where not only do you say you have 10% of the stock, but you have to state what your intention is with that 10%. So if you're just an investor, you say, well, I'm just a passive investor. But if you have an intention of taking over the company, i.e. gaining 51%, you have to say that and therefore make an official tender offer, which raises the cost of doing it, raising the cost of business, because you have to let the world know what you're doing, so you have to pay a significant premium on the stock. And even if you just intend to have 10 15%, and, you know, just knock on the board's door and, and yell and, 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 and be active, you have to let the world know. Otherwise, you could get in trouble if after the fact it turns out that you are an activist investor and you didn't announce it. That's the, the um, Williams Act of 1968 put all those provisions in. In spite of all those provisions, we still had takeovers in the 80s, but note that today you almost never see a hostile takeover. It is very, very rare because it is very difficult to do. Okay. So a hostile takeover is another form of fixing problems when they happen. You're not doing a good job managing the company. I think I can do a better job managing the company. I pay a premium to come and shareholders in order to replace you in a sense. If I'm successful, I make a lot of money. If I'm not successful, I lose a lot of money. But it's, that's business. Yeah. We'll see that today, to some extent, private equity is serving a similar function. Although note that almost all the private equity deals done today are friendly deals. They're not hostile deals. They're deals in which... Uh, private equity team up with management 
uh, in order to, to take over a company and to buy out the shareholders. And we'll talk about why, why I think private equity is so popular right now. Um, uh, some other options the market allows us. Shareholders can get together. They can get together and um, vote the board out. <laughs> you know, they can get together 51% of the, of the shares and, and replace the board. You know, shareholders can't do that. It's called a proxy fight. And it's expensive. It's not easy. But let me point this out. The regulations make it much more expensive than it needs to be. For example, shareholders, there are all kinds of regulations about what shareholders can talk to each other about. And under what conditions I can say what to you if we're two large shareholders. It, it becomes very cumbersome and, and, and uh, costly to put on a proxy fight. Now, it should be costly. This is not something that should be done lightly. But regulations make it much more costly than it would otherwise be. Okay? So there are me market mechanisms to resolve whatever issues might occur as a consequence of separation of ownership control. But, but most of those mechanisms have been eliminated by government regulation. And then when a problem happens, who's the villain? The market is the villain. The market is the villain. The market that we would have solved the problem. And who's regulated? The market's regulated. And as a consequence, we take more out of the market in terms of its ability, its flexibility to adjust, to correct, to fix problems when they occur. Yeah. So what means are actually left open to fix these kind of problems? Well, as I said, you, you can still do a proxy fight. It's expensive. You can still do... Uh, shareholder activists are still out there, although there are, there are few of them, and, and it's, again, it's quite expensive. And again, note that while the hedge fund industry is still almost unregulated, that is changing. We're seeing more and more regulations now in hedge funding. There's a whole movement to regulate hedge funds. So even that one island of freedom, if you will, in the financial markets is going to come under regulations now. Already you have to register with SEC. I mean, it's, it's complicated, but you, you, have to, you, you already have to do some things. I can see a day when... If the right pressure group comes around to influence Congress, you could see a shutting down of the ability of hedge funds to kind of advocate for their position. Um, private equity is a solution. We'll, we'll, see, we'll, see, uh, we'll see that uh, later. Um, you can still do hostile takeovers in some places, but again, they're more expensive. There are no. There are none. You know, uh, one of the things that happened in Japan, um, it, for, for a whole other set of reasons, uh, Japanese companies, many of the Japanese companies, particularly in the middle market, were very, very inefficient. And, and the whole ownership structure and the whole involvement of the government and the banks in Japan in, to, in literally in the companies and the fact that they wouldn't allow companies to go bankrupt and nobody was laid off created these uh, really inefficient companies in Japan. And when the stock market crashed, that became evident. And I remember a headline in, in Forbes magazine in somewhere around 1990. Six, seven, eight. When it was clear Japan was not coming out of this, they'd been in a, basically a depression for five, six, seven years, and nothing was happening. And the headline was, "What Japan needs is Michael Milken." Hmm. Now, what Japan needed is not quite Michael Milken, but what Japan needed is free financial markets, because financial markets can fix these things. People like actually Chibun Pickens tried to do a hostile takeover of a Japanese company in the '90s. And the idea was to take one of these inefficient behemoths and break them up and make them more efficient, lay off the people who need to be laid off, and, and refocus the company. And the Japanese laughed him out of the country. I mean, he had no chance of doing it. So if, if Japan had free financial markets, or even semi-free financial markets like we do in this country, they wouldn't have been, in my view, in a, in a depression. I think the biggest constraint on Japan, economically, was its inability to restructure itself. Free markets can restructure themselves. That's the correcting mechanism for when something goes wrong. When a businessman or a particular business or even an industry, if, if, if something, if bad decisions are made or, 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 or crooks, you know, take control or whatever. You know, although that's kind of bizarre how crook, crooks take control of an industry in an unregulated environment. It's interesting. The crooks can take control of an industry in a regulated environment. I think that happened quite a bit in the SNL crisis. But it could only, you have to wonder, why SNLs? Why did Crooks and SNL, why did that? Well, because of the particular nature of the regulations of SNLs made that combination feasible. In a truly free market, that would have never happened. Of course, we'd never have SNLs in a truly free market.
Yeah. I would I would say uh, would I say that the current bid by Dow jo uh, by um, Murdoch to take over Dow Jones, i.e., the Wall Street Journal, was a hostile takeover? Uh, yes, in one sense. Yes, in the sense that they didn't talk to them before; they just made a bid uh, and put it out there into the public. However, if if Dow Jones wouldn't have wanted to do it, if if the Bankoff family, I think, owns Dow Jones, they have controlling they control the voting shares. If, if they had got together and said, we don't want this, I don't care what price it is, we don't want it, they, they, wouldn't, have, they wouldn't have sold. Uh, and and it, it would have been, it, it could have gotten ugly in terms of the proceedings. There could have been lawsuits, all kinds of things. What's happened is the Bank of Pharma, it seems, has negotiated with Murdoch, and it looks like a sale is going to happen uh, on terms that are agreeable to both parties. Okay, so I think Murdoch knew when he made the bid that uh, that it was he made such a high bid. I mean, he he it's a huge premium uh, that it would be so appealing to the to the bankrupt family that ultimately they would succumb. But in 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 the 1980s, these things led to lawsuits, led to white nights where the company found another investor to come in, and I mean, this was real you know conflicts and and real you know I don't like to use uh, warfare terms to describe business. Uh, because it suggests a zero-sum game, and it's not. Uh, but real struggles, real challenges uh, that have involved. Right? Even hostile takeover, you know, it's, hostile is it's just not the right term, because ultimately, who is it hostile towards? It's actually incredibly friendly to shareholders, right? Because what are you doing? You're offering them a premium. So it's hostile. You know, maybe the, sh the managers don't like it, but, s but so what? That doesn't make it... I, you'll notice that uh, it, it, when people want to disparage business, they use warfare, violent terms in order to describe it. And there's a reason. Because they want to give you the perception of zero sum. And they want to give you the perception of no difference between economic power and political power. No difference between the dollar and the gun. So they use, they use terms that, are, that, are, that suggest violence. When there's no violence, this is all voluntary. Bottom line... It's all voluntary. There's nothing being forced. Something I've seen work on smaller stocks is uh, investment newsletters. Investment newsletters doing, uh, writing them up. Affecting uh, management. Yeah, somebody notices that there's something bad going on. Uh, indeed, you know, to, to some extent, Enron's decline was brought about by stories in Business Week and the Wall Street Journal that brought out, you know, some, some shady, what they believed were shady, uh, transactions and that alerted the markets to what was going on. Uh, there were already people in the markets alerted to that through short, seller, short sellers, but it certain, certainly alerted them uh, to that issue. Um, finally, the third market that functions here is the market for the services of managers. You know, unless a manager thinks this is his last job ever and it doesn't matter, well, I mean, there's quite a bit of turnover among CEOs. Uh, I'll give you some statistics uh, in a little while. But there's quite a bit of turnover among CEOs, and a CEO uh, wants another job. You know, it's, it, again, the perception in the culture is, um, I don't know, and Nardelli at Home Depot made $164 million, so he's going to retire, obviously. But Nardelli loves business. This is what he loves to do. He wants another job. This is not just about the money. The money's important, but it's not just about the money. It's about the love of the work. And somebody in Nardelli doesn't want to go out of Home Depot like he did um, as a, 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 as, with the perception of being a bad CEO because that means he won't get a job later on. So the market, the labor market for CEOs has an impact here. Again, to align those interests when and if they get out of whack. Okay? So the market has solutions to this problem. But at every place, or almost every place, uh, government regulation has come in to hold, to, to, to block, to, 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 uh, to suppress. And in my view, to the extent that we've seen real problems, like in the late 1990s, with, uh, with the Enrons and the WorldComs and all those companies, in my view, that is not a failure of the market. That is a failure of regulation. That is the consequence of placing so many roadblocks on the market to function. And, you know, 
I'll also argue in a minute that it's no accident that these kind of cases happen when they happen. Uh, you know, it's, it's not an accident that all these cases came to light in 99-2000 at the top of what I consider a stock market bubble, but those two are related as well. But I'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Uh, finally, there are internal things that we can do uh, to make sure, and, and that any rational company does uh, quite easily, to ensure that managers and shareholders are more aligned. Stock options were a great mechanism to help do that. Fantastic mechanism to do that because let's say, like we talked about last time, that it, it, there's something inherent about uh, the CEO that would make him more risk averse than the shareholders because the shareholders are diversified, right? Then how do we encourage the manager to take risk? By rewarding them. By rewarding them, but rewarding risk slightly disproportionately. And how do you do that? A stock option. Stock option rewards risk taking. And, and, and it aligns the interest because the stock goes up, the manager does very well. If the stock goes down, he gets nothing. Okay? So stock options, just stock grants, are, are align the interest. So there are internal mechanisms, simple stuff that, you know, stock options are a little bit more complex, uh, but they came about in the 1980s and were incredibly popular. And of course, today, they are viewed as the big demon, right? Yeah. Do you see reporting stock options as expenses a good thing or part of sort of destroying one of these correction methodologies? So um, should stock options be reported at expense? I don't have a strong view about this. I think that ultimately they do need to be, particularly in high-tech companies where they will issue enormous numbers of stock options so that the dilutive effect on shareholders was substantial. I think they probably should have. But this is my view of, uh, and I was I was going to leave this stand, but this is my view is that in a truly free market, the market would decide that. In a truly free market, you would have competing accounting standards. I mean, maybe it would all end up being one. I doubt it because I think that different industries would probably get different uh, accounting treatment. I don't think that all industries need to have exactly the same accounting. I don't think that accounting for a bank is the same as the accounting for Cisco. There are just different ways in which you should value, uh, you should value uh, revenue, the way you account for revenue or liabilities. It's just complex. I believe that in a truly free market, you might have accounting standards that develop around industries. You might have accounting standards that develop around uh, the, uh, like the NYC or the NASDAQ, right? So the NYC might have its own standard in the NASDAQ. I'm not sure. I mean, one of the, things I'm gonna, one of the points I'm going to make is I don't try to predict how markets would actually behave in a truly free market because they're far more innovative than I could ever imagine. But I do know that markets can come up with solutions. So whether to expect options or not is something that ultimately should be a market question. And, and I haven't seen any studies, but there probably are studies to see if once this option issue came about, did the market not get it? Because ultimately, most, all of these were reported. So I'm a sophisticated shareholder, or I'm an analyst at an investment bank, and Cisco just issued 20% of its stock as options, even if they don't put it into the financial statement, I should be able to figure it out. And if I didn't, whose fault is it? So again, I'm torn. I think ultimately it belongs probably as an expense, but I would leave it to the market to, 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 to determine that, to, you know, uh, uh, to accounting firms in a truly free market to dictate that. Um, Okay, uh, let, me, let me just, one last point about this, uh, this issue, and that is that the separation of ownership control is no way as bad as most academics present it. That is, if you actually look at share ownership in the United States, it's fairly concentrated. Uh, there are significant block holders. Uh, they, they're not as active as maybe we would like them to be, but they're there. Um, it's not true that share ownership is as dispersed, you know, millions of people, unrelated. It, it, and it's also true that managers own quite a bit of stock. So the whole issue is somewhat, you know, is, is exaggerated dramatically, put it that way. Okay, let me say something, let me say something about bubbles, which I think is going to be the most controversial thing I say, um, and then we'll move uh, quickly on. Uh, I, I believe that bubbles do exist, uh, stock market bubbles, and, and I would define the stock market bubble as when uh, the value of the stocks, when a broad broad number of stocks, uh, their value has departed from a rational discounted present value of their potential future earnings. 
So when it's departed from reality. Um, I think they're very rare, to, they're very difficult to call, although at the peak you usually know it's a peak, and they're almost impossible to identify when they were going to end. <laughs> I, and I know lots of other people, have actually lost money on that particular <laughs> attempt as to, as to predict when the downside is going to happen. Uh, but I don't think that it, at, the, at the height they are difficult to call. I think it's quite easy to see when they happen. Um, I don't, I'm not an expert on this, so what I'm going to say now in terms of why I think they happen is, from my perspective, still speculation. Uh, I'm not, uh, I haven't looked into it as, as deeply, you know, since the bubble was bust, I've not been exactly, I, I've, I was a finance professor before the bubble, not after. Um, and, and in those days, I didn't believe, in, and I have to admit that in the mid-90s and so on, and, and towards the even in, in much of the late 90s, I didn't believe that they existed. So uh, uh, I think it's the reality. And the reality of actually trading in the market, which ultimately convinced me that bubbles do exist. And, and, and I'll tell you why we're even talking about bubbles in a minute. I, I think that bubbles, um, uh, my, my view of the bubbles are, are caused ultimately by monetary policy combined with uh, a certain euphoria among investors associated with, with technological change. Um, I, I think it's caused by the printing of money, by inflation, ultimately. I think that just like inflation fools businessmen, it fools investors as well. Uh, and, and I think money does sometimes will flow into financial markets and not be flowing to prices, into goods, in a way as to be perceived as price inflation. But you could see asset price inflation rather than uh, a good the, the prices of goods increasing, and I think, I think there's a correlation there between the increase in the money supply and uh, the existence of bubbles. But I think it has to be more than that. I think something has to happen to get people very excited and to get people so excited that they behave irrationally. And I think that a significant number of investors during the late 1990s behaved irrationally. Uh, they took a legitimate technological change, i.e., the Internet, technology, telecommunications, fiber optics, all of that exciting, wonderful stuff that was going on, and, and extrapolated off of that irrationally, including extrapolating Fed behavior irrationally. That is, assuming they, the Fed would behave in ways that it didn't, and, and everybody should know they wouldn't, uh, you know, like decreasing interest rates uh, uh, forever and never increasing them. Um, so, that, uh, so that people are willing to buy stock at ever-increasing prices on ridiculous or non-news, uh, on, on, on little or no information. Uh, and you can see that with individual stocks. It's relatively easy to see. We saw it all the time. Uh, you know, uh, my, fa my favorite story, because I lost a lot of money on this, uh, for somebody else, unfortunately, it's much easier to lose your own money, believe me. It's much, much harder when you lose other people's money. Is, is, uh, and I'll tell you this quick story. Um, there was a bank um, in uh, 1999 called NetBank. Uh, and NetBank was trading at 40 bucks a share, which made it, uh, by any ratio you measured, the most expensive bank in the country. It was, uh, for those of you who know anything about, it was trading at something like six to eight times book. Right. And what was NetBank? NetBank was a bank that accepted deposits over the web and didn't have branches, so it couldn't give out loans, so it went and bought out mortgage-backed securities. So it had a nice 2% spread, pretty good business, you make 2%, you can make a lot of money, but 2%, that's it. So normal banks were making 3-4%, right? Because they, they could lend at prime plus. And to attract money over the web, NetBank had to offer above-market deposit rates. So its spread was really low for the, for the, for the banking market at that point in time. Uh, 99, this, the yield curve was pretty steep. Um, and it was yet, it was the most expensive bank in the United States. Um, we shorted this bank. I shorted the bank on behalf of a client um, at 40 bucks a share because we figured eight, eight times book. Most banks at the, in those days were selling at below two times book. So this was four times more expensive than, than most other banks in the country. Uh, during one week in April of 1999, actually during one day, in April of 1999, that stock went from 40 bucks to $250. And on a $200,000 short position, I lost a million bucks. <laughs> that still causes goosebumps. Um, <laughs> the next day, and, and of course, my investor was on the phone, and, uh, and my view was, 
let's just wait. I mean, it's going to come down. And here's your view what? I didn't make money by waiting. You liquidate the position now. We recognize the loss, and we move on, which is how he made money. Um, so the next day, we liquidate the loss. And of course, by then, it already come down to 160. Right? So it went 40 to 250 to 160. And um, two years later, uh, the stock was trading at around four. And today, just, just a few weeks ago, actually, NetBank was finally liquidated. It sold off all, all its assets and is gone, uh, which <laughs> caused quite a bit of chuckle around the office, you know, my, my former financial office, uh, you know, remembering uh, stories of NetBank. Not only that, but during that one week in April, the same week that NetBank uh, went like that, a number of small community banks around the country announced that they were launching uh, internet banking um, activities. And in the future, they weren't even now launching. They had plans. And their stock doubled. A number of them. And luckily in those, we caught it at the top and shorted it and, and made some money because the Nick, within that week, the stocks went up and then they crashed. So it was a one-week bubble in bank stocks that announced internet something. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we made money off of that. We, I mean, we lost money off NetBank much more than we made off of the other ones, but we made a little bit of money off of the other ones um, by shorting them and by doing that, hopefully correcting uh, back to, to normal prices. And it lasted a week for banks. Now, banks are not exactly a sexy, hot industry. It lasted a lot longer for dot-coms of a wide variety. But, but it happened. It happened. Now, why is this an issue? Um, I mean, it's an issue for a lot of Lots of economic reasons, because it, it causes misallocation of capital and so on. But it's an issue with regard to, to what we're talking about as well. Because it creates, uh, now the stock market is not acting as a signal. Indeed, when a bubble occurs, the stock market is acting as a false signal, providing managers with false incentives, providing them with incentives to invest in the wrong places. And it's no accident that all the Corrupt, all the corruption that happened that was discovered in 2001, 2002 happened in high-flying stocks, where there was Enron or WorldCom or all these, all, all the, uh, it happened, uh, two features of these industries. All the corruption happened in high-flying stocks and heavily regulated industries, all of them. Utilities and telecom, all of the problems were in utilities and telecom. Heavily regulated industries going through regulatory change, re-regulation as I like to call it, but where they could manipulate stuff and they could schmooze with the regulators and get it manipulated, and where their stocks were in the stratosphere completely, in my view, detached from reality. That provided wrong incentives, uh, uh, wrong incentives in terms of investment, and I think it caused managers to suddenly focus more and more on what somebody called quarterly expectations, quarterly earnings. And as a consequence, they started manipulating those quarterly earnings because the stock market was so irrationally, in my view, sensitive to those numbers. So instead of the stock market, as it is most of the time, I believe markets are efficient most of the time, as it does most of the time, project out into the future, not just look at today's number, but look at today's number in the context of what numbers are coming in the future and adjust all of that and discount it all back to get a stock price today. During the bubble, the market was looking at every number as you know, way out of proportion. And managers responded to that. And some of them responded to that in dishonest ways by finagling the numbers. But they also believed what the market was telling them. So for example, the story in WorldCom goes like this. Um, they had a bad quarter. Right? The stock, the stock price was valuing them at some astronomical amount. They, they landed up being the largest bankruptcy in American, in, in U.S. history, bigger than anyone. Uh, so the, the market was valuing them, and, and they were laying fiber optics, by the way, which everybody was laying fiber optics. Uh, and, and somebody should have seen that, and I think a lot of people did. Oh, by the way, what happened during the 1990s is the people who typically would short and correct problems were exiting the market. Because believe me, after NetBank, the word came down, you don't touch anything with technology. You can still short banks, but you don't touch any bank with the technology, you know, any net bank like. So we exited the market. So we who did shorting, who helped correct valuations, were out of the market. And indeed, if you know Julian Rob Robertson, the, the big hedge fund manager, was one of the most successful hedge fund managers in history, in, in 1999, shut down his fund 
took, I think it was three and a half, four billion dollars, handed it back to investors, says, I don't get this market, I'm gone. <laughs> and, this, and Warren Buffett wasn't trading much in those days, because he, and he said publicly, I don't get this market. So a lot of, in my view, rational investors exited the market, st stood on the sidelines, and watched. Because they didn't, they did, you, again, you don't know when the correction, when your short position will actually pay off. Um, so what was happening at WorldCom was they believed in this high valuation. They had a bad quarter, and they went, we could announce the bad quarter to the market, and our stock would plummet because we've seen what happens to other people. But we know, and the market seems to indicate, that our long-term prospects are fantastic. So what we'll do is we'll, 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 we'll cheat a little bit on this one quarter. And next quarter will be so good that we'll cheat downwards next quarter and we'll flatten it all out. It's called smoothing. It has a technical term. Earning smoothing, right? Of course, the next quarter comes around and it's worse than the first quarter. But the stock price is still in the stratospheres and they're still convinced that they are doing well and they cheat again. And it doesn't take many quarters before you're, you've cheated on $7 billion. Because it's, a, you, know, you know, in gambling... When you, when you lose a little bit, and then you double up, and then you lose again, and you double up. It's the same thing with cheating. <laughs> it happens the same thing if things are getting worse and not better like you predict. And that's exactly what happened at WorldCom. Nobody at WorldCom sat down and said, how can we steal money from shareholders? Indeed, everybody at WorldCom, most of the people at WorldCom lost everything. It's not like the CEO walked away with gazillions of dollars because he committed fraud. The fraud was committed in order to... Uh, adjust expectations, you know, adjust the earnings. Okay. And that happened for most of these companies. Yeah. Are you, are you, let me see if I understand. Are you saying that uh, these bubbles would happen because of the technology or euphoria without the monetary policy and the, uh, you know, the regulatory environment? If you, if you had, in, in a truly free market, would bubbles happen? Right. Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. And the reason is, a, you would take out the monetary impetus, and B, um, it, there's another, there's another uh, a problem with uh, regulatory problem, and that is that it's much easier to buy a stock than to short it. Uh, shorting, uh, there's a lot of regulations that restrict your ability to short. Uh, so I think shorty would be easier. I also think, and, and, and maybe this is also, you know, I also think that if you had a free market, people would just be more rational. Maybe that's a prerequisite for having the free market to begin with. Um, and I do believe that the state of the culture, and, and again, this is not necessarily accepted, accepted among objectives, but I do believe that the state of the culture affects the extent to which markets are efficient. If everybody, if everybody in the culture is being taught by public education and can't read and do math, then the stock market's not going to be as efficient as if everybody in the culture has a much better level of education. Would insider trading help to prevent bubbles? Yes, insider trading would help to prevent bubbles. And I, and I don't want to go into a whole discussion. With I'm, 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 again, my view of insider trading is this. Let the market decide. I don't think it's a government function to dictate. It's a contractual issue between managers and shareholders and exchanges. And, and between those three parties, they would have to decide whether insider trading was allowed. I think if it was allowed, it would be allowed only in certain situations. It would not be just short your own, because obviously, for example, you couldn't let CEOs short their own stock. Um, so, you know, I think it would be, I think, again, it's a contractual issue. And I suspect that most insider trading would not be allowed. But, I, but again, I, I think that the market should decide. The market should. I, can, I can make really good economic arguments why insider trading is really good for prices and for markets. But I can also make arguments why, from a shareholder perspective, you, you want to limit it somewhat. And, and, it, and, and again, I, I don't try to predict how those contracts would, would be finalized in a truly free market. Okay. Uh, generally, I mean, if we believe prices should, uh, uh, the most efficient price is that which has the most information, then inside the trading conveys the most information, and therefore prices would be more efficient. Okay, so, so bubbles, I think, are a, a cause of, of a lot of the problems that we, that we saw in the late 1990s. And if you add to that the fact that these were regulated industries where, where a lot of what they, they got, they got not because they were great businessmen, but because they were great schmoozers. Uh, it's no accident, in my view, that Ken Lay at Enron, uh, most of the photographs you see of him are with the Bushes or with other local politicians in Texas.
and he had to. I'm not even blaming him because if you are in the utilities business, your survival depends on your ability to schmooze with politicians. And indeed, one of the real risks that we face as we move forward is that the more and more regulations you place in business, the more and more you attract to the CEO position schmoozers rather than businessmen. Political types like the guy who runs Procter & Gamble who admits he's a politician, first and foremost, rather than real CEOs dedicated to business, dedicated to making money. And that, that is a risk we run, and I think we're already starting to see the signs of that happening. Okay, let me go through some of, uh, some of these issues that I said that I would uh, go through. Uh, I think we've talked about corporate democracy, so I'm not going to talk much about that. We've already discussed it, uh, you know, why it's wrong, why it doesn't make any sense, um, why indeed I think shareholders today have too much voting uh, power, not too little voting power. Uh, the only area where I'd like to see that freed up is in the area of, of shareholders talking to one another, shareholders coordinating in, in cases like proxy fights and so on. But in terms of they should only, in my view, be allowed to vote on economic issues, i.e. issues related to profit maximization. Okay. So I think what we need is less democracy, not more democracy. Um, and and at the root cause here is a confusion between political and economic power. Is this idea that the corporation is somehow a political model versus an economic model. Um, Okay, let me talk about CEO pay because that's, uh, that's a big issue. Uh, what's the claim of CEO pay? It goes back to the separation of ownership control. The CEO controls the board, therefore he can manipulate the board. Shareholders don't have a say, and, and they're not, you know, often they don't know because disclosure is so weak, right? Uh, and therefore CEOs manage to pocket much more money than they deserve. And, and the example given, uh, the example most evident in, in recent in the last year or so, has been Nardelli at, at uh, Home Depot, right? Here's a CEO uh, of a company whose stock basically went nowhere. It was flat during his tenure. Uh, and when he was fired, who was making a significant amount of money as salary, and then when he was fired, um, had a, had a, got a huge um, a pension, which was worth $30, $40 million. Okay. So he landed up over the life of, the, of his tenure, over the five years, I think making 160 something million dollars. So it's a huge sum. Now, how could that happen? Well, who is, who was Robert Nardelli? Yeah. Do you have to believe that markets are efficient in order to criticize that? Because, so the stock price went nowhere, but the earnings went up the whole time. Yeah, but I actually think that the earnings, that the stock market was right. That is, I think he made mistakes. I think, I think he wasn't good for Home Depot. He landed up that he did not do. A ho now, you could also argue that the industry was in bad shape, but if you look at Lowe's, their competitor, they did phenomenally well during that same period. So I think Nadelli was also in a tricky situation because, well, let's, let's first talk about who Nadelli is and then we'll talk about it. Now, Delhi was number two at General Electric, um, or, or one, of, one of three people who were number two at General Electric under Jack Welsh. In other words, one of the best businessmen in the country, according to Jack Welsh, who, you know, is a giant among American CEOs over the last hundred years, one of the giants, um, in terms of wealth creation for, for shareholders, in terms of uh, the business model he built. Um, and when, it, when Jack Welsh retired, there were three people who were candidates to replace his job. Jeff Immelt, uh, Nardelli, and, and a third person whose, whose name I can't remember. Nardelli was considered the favorite. He was the most Jack Welsh-like in, um, in character. Uh, and he was considered the favorite to replace Jack Welsh. And what's interesting is that the board jo chose Jeff Immelt. And I think, uh, I think the board uh, chose Jeff Immelt uh, I don't know if you follow GE, but if you follow Jeff Immelt, Jeff Immelt's more of a politician. Jeff Immelt is a stakeholder guy. He's a schmoozer. He's a f environmental friendly. He's worker friendly. And they, I think, saw the shifting winds and decided to go with that political type of CEO rather than a hard-nosed Nardelli type CEO. Nardelli is also a manufacturing guy. His whole career was in manufacturing. He did phenomenally well. If you look at his, his background, how he did a G, he did phenomenally well. 
uh, when he ran businesses. He was so here's a superstar, a literally a superstar, maybe the most coveted CEO to be available at that point in time when at Home Depot, which at the time was flying high, stock was very high, and the founder retired. The founder who had built up, and they were looking for CEO, and they got, by all estimates, the best CEO in the country. And they negotiated a, a, a contract. And at the time, if you had looked at the contract, you would have said, wow, Home Depot got a good deal. Because at the time, Mount Daly looked like the best CEO in the country. Now, looking back, Home Depot is in a retail business. Not Delhi was a manufacturing guy. Maybe he wasn't the best fit. Maybe the board made a mistake. But that's all ex post. That's not, that's cheating. <laughs> if we could do that in life, if we could go back and fix all our mistakes, I, I would have never done NetBank. <laughs> <laughs> but ex ante, that is pre, it looked like a great contract. And the board was happy. Shareholders were happy. And for whatever reason, and we could speculate forever, it didn't work out. Share price stayed flat. Maybe the stock was inflated when he took it over, which, which could be because, because of the time period when it was. Maybe the, the previous, you know, the founder had grown Home Depot to, you know, to its max, and there was very little way, no way to go. Maybe now Delhi made lots of mistakes and he was lousy for Home Depot. I don't know. I haven't gone that deep into it. But it's irrelevant. How did he now did he get fired? A, a hedge fund, uh, a, a, an investor, didn't like now daily strategy was getting to wholesale stuff. And he went to the board and he knocked on the board's door and said, look, I, don't, I think the strategy's wrong. I think the CEO's taking you in the wrong direction. I really think you should do something about it. And he made a lot of noise. And I think some other pension funds and so on made some noise. And they made noise primarily because of the, CEO, the pay. But the, the original hedge fund guy, it wasn't about the pay. It was about the strategy. And the board looked at it, and they decided that it, they were probably, the critics were probably right, and they fired now Delhi. And now to me, that's the market working. And now Delhi got a pension plan because five years earlier, that's the contract that he signed. And that's the cost, and that's the cost in this case of a mistake. But mistakes happen. Okay, so to me, the whole thing is an example of, of the market working. Options backdating do this without getting too technical. Uh, CEOs are granted options. Uh, they're typically at, uh, granted options for tax reasons, primarily for tax reasons, at uh, the current price of the stock. Okay? Uh, there's an advantage to getting stock options at below the current price of the stock, because then they're already worth something when they were already granted. So what some companies did is they backdated them, i.e., the current price of the stock is 20, but six months ago, it was 10. So we priced them at 10, even though they're issued today. And, you know, for various, and, and the way these things are reported, most companies actually reported that fact. Most companies actually reported that fact. And you could argue, and I think legitimately, if they didn't report it, given all the regulations and so on, and given the shareholders' expectations, that was probably wrong. They should have reported it to shareholders, okay, if they backdated them. But all that a backdating did was provide more compensation to the CEO. And as a consequence, he probably got less compensation somewhere else because the package probably wouldn't have changed. It probably would have been the same package. But this was a tax efficient, I can't remember the exact specifics of why it's tax efficient, but there's a tax efficiency to doing the backdating rather than paying him in another way. Okay. And yet, the, you know, again, I think there have been almost no prosecutions of this, but the, but the SEC is investigating hundreds of companies. And, of course, a huge uproar and another reason why CO pay is out of control. It isn't. They, they could not align any of this backdating with extraordinary pay. Most of the time, it was just a different form of pay. It was just a choice between different options. Um, 
Welcome to the Total Wireless Store, where total confidence awaits. I need to keep up with my teens this summer without sweating high cell phone bills. Don't worry. You got this with Total Wireless. We have plans to fit all your family's needs starting at just 25 bucks on the nation's best 4G LTE network. I won't miss a thing. Now you can focus on the important stuff, like arguing about curfew. Discover the Total Wireless stores and get total confidence. The latest phones, the best network, all at great prices. Now open in L.A. Refer to the latest terms and conditions of service at TotalWireless.com. What other ones were there? Yeah. Is there anything at all wrong with backdating? Only if it's not reported. No, but there's nothing wrong with backdating. As long as, as, long as you, the shareholder, know, because it affects you, the shareholder. Uh, other than that, there's nothing wrong with backdating. I mean, again, I don't want to get into the tax implications because they were, they were claiming that there was, this was some tax manipulation, but that's the problem with the tax people. I don't, you know, there's nothing, you know. What, I read stories on this trying to figure out what the earth was the problem with it, and an enormous fuss and made enormous scandals the, the, only, the only issue is that if the shareholders are led to expect that they're getting accurate information about options, and then it turns out that the information they're getting on is not accurate, then that's deceptive. That's deceptive practices. It might even be fraud in some cases. But if shareholders are told, then what difference does it make? They don't affect shareholders. It doesn't affect customers. It doesn't affect suppliers. It doesn't affect uh, employees. It doesn't affect them. Indeed, indeed, one of the unreported things about it, and this is something that living in Silicon Valley, everybody, literally everybody knew everybody was backdating. I mean, those of you who live in Silicon Valley, you worked in Silicon Valley, we knew that everybody in technology was backdating, right? And it wasn't just CEO's options that were being backdated. Everybody's options were being backdated. Uh, when you went to work for, for Cisco, I'm just picking on Cisco because it comes to mind. Uh, you went to work for Cisco, you were given, there, there was something, you could buy the stock, every six months you could buy the stock at the lowest price it had been during those six, six months. So they would give you stock at some low price. And, not, and they were doing the same thing with options. Not true. Not? Yeah. For Cisco, not true? I work Cisco. Oh, oh sorry. So I'm picking up Cisco. I should have. It was but it was happening IBM. all over Silicon Valley. <laughs> IBM was doing that. IBM was doing that. We've got an IBM person. The IBM was doing it. It was happening. And it wasn't just the CEO. It was all the employees. Yeah. The, isn't just the only issue that it's an expense to pay the employees the difference between the stock price and the whole stock? Sure. But again, if you're reporting, anybody can do the math. So that's the only issue. Yeah. Is it is it the issue that it's an expense? Because now now the options are in the money, so they have a value, right? So there's a certain expense associated with that. Again, it goes back to expensing of options. And again, if you report it, the shareholders can do their own math. Okay. So that's my view back then. Um, okay. So. Again, we've seen this story. Now, what do the empirical evidence suggest about CEO pay? Well, a little known fact is that since 2000 uh, to date, CEO pay has actually declined. It's been flat to declining. And given the stock market performance, particularly in those early years past 2000, you would expect that. A lot of stock options weren't worth, weren't worth very much. A lot of stock compensation schemes didn't work very favorably to CEOs in the stock market collapsed. So CEO pay indeed has not grown much since 2000. CEO pay grew a lot, a lot, much faster than uh, pay in the economy between 1990 and 2000. Isn't a large part of that just the talent pool and what CEOs are expecting to get paid? Yeah. If you want the we'll good get guys to why it happened. Yeah. yeah, we'll get to why it happened. Something else interesting is between 1990 and 2000, indeed actually continued the trend even to today, Many other high-paid individuals' salaries grew at faster rates than CEOs. Athletes. If you look at athletes, how much they paid in 1990, how much they were paid on 2000 on average, athletes, uh, high-level athletes' pay grew much faster during that same period than CEO pay. The amount of uh, income generated by hedge fund managers grew much, much faster than private equity managers, private equity venture capital managers, drew much, much faster from 1990 to 2000 than CEO pay. Uh, pay on Wall Street, investment banker pay, grew much, much faster from 1990 to, two th to today than CEO pay. 
In other words, in extraordinarily talent, in, in, in that segment of the population of extraordinary talent, pay grew at astronomical rates, really, really high rates, I mean, at spectacular rates, between 1990 and today. CEOs actually slightly underperform the rest of the high owners, not overperform. Now, we can now talk about why that happens. Why is talent more valued over the last 15 years? And I think there are a lot of reasons, and, and most of them have to do with supply and demand. Uh, in the case of athletes, it also has to do with increased wealth and the fact that we're willing to spend more money on athletic activities, and therefore they can charge higher, seat, higher rates for the seats, and therefore they can afford, they, you, know, they, uh, you know, they can pass on the cost because of the, the, the increased wealth. But we're willing to pay for that. We're willing to pay for that in the case of athletes. We're willing to pay for that in the case of movie uh, stars. Um, and in the case of CEOs, I think the situation is simple. There's a talent shortage. There are very few CEOs in the world who can manage a large corporation. It's hard. And it's huge demand. Because the demand today is not just from the US. This is where globalization plays an important role. Globalization has created demand for CEO talent all over the world. Who's running Chinese companies, big Chinese companies? Uh, some of them are Chinese, but many of them are Chinese from Hong Kong. Right, so they're driving CEOs away from Hong Kong to mainland China. Many of them are from Taiwan. Many of them are from Malaysia, ethnic Chinese from these other countries. But somebody has to fill in in these other countries. And we're seeing Americans go overseas to run companies. Who, who runs uh, Sony today? I mean, this is unheard of because it's Japan who is the most... It's a British guy, right? <laughs> Run Sony. I think he's British. British or American? I think he's British. Uh, you're seeing a global market for CEO talent. In Europe, you're seeing American CEOs go to Europe. You're seeing European CEOs in America. There's huge demand for CEO talent, particularly for extraordinary CEO talent. And there's a shortage in supply. And what happens when, that, when you have a situation like that where demand is going up, supply is constrained, prices go up? To, to attract more talent to that profession. Okay? And indeed, the opposite, in my view, is happening at the low end of the skills of the job market, right? At the lower end, you've got lots of people who can do the simple jobs. And indeed, as borders open and as capital can move around, you can pay somebody in China a lot less than you can pay somebody in the United States to put two things together, you know, to, to screw a screw. And therefore, Salaries at the low end, wages at the low end are going to decline, or jobs are just going to move elsewhere at the low end. But at the high end, they're going to increase. Globalization has brought that. Now, will that always happen? Probably not, because what will happen? You know, if there's talent in the world, I mean, ultimately, remember the theme of Alice Shrugged, right? <laughs> China will develop its own talent. And now maybe one day Chinese CEOs will be running American CEOs if, if the world, you know, if China goes the right way and everything goes well and capitalism really does thrive and so on. Okay. But for now, that's the situation. I think the same is true for investment bankers. The same is true for hedge fund managers. I just think there's a shortage of talent, and that's a consequence of a bad educational system. It's a consequence of the cult of culture we live in. It's a consequence of a lot of things, that there's just fewer people who rise to the top. And when they do rise to the top, they're worth more. They're worth more. More of a corporation's resources are going to be allocated to paying a CEO a lot of money because they need a CEO, and there's very few talented CEOs out there. So uh, the whole issue of CEO pay seems to, be, uh, seems to be a completely bogus issue. Um, there might be exceptions. I'm not saying there are no CEOs out there in some company that hasn't done well, who make more money than they should make because of all the other inefficiencies I've talked about that don't allow the market to correct. Those companies should, would be taken over. In a true free market, those companies would be taken over or somebody would buy up a block of shares and kick the CEO out. But we don't have that kind of dynamic market to allow that to happen. So yes, there are abusers here and there. But as a systematic thing, it's just not the case. And indeed, one of the claims is, right, that the CEO has the board in his pocket. 
and that CEOs can get away with these high pay because the boards are not monitoring them and therefore let them get away with whatever they want. But if you look at the empirical evidence again, turnover among CEOs is at the highest rate it's ever been in American history. CEO tenure today is, on average, is six years. Six years. You can't do much in six years. And most of these are the board stepping in and firing a CEO, the board initiating some kind of transition. And if the board is so impotent, how could they do that? Now, I think there's, some, there's a certain unhealthiness about every six years replacing a CEO. Uh, but the fact that it's happening suggests that the boards are not impotent, that the boards indeed are more active than people expect them to act. So um, there's just no empirical evidence for this, uh, for, for a problem to be, uh, for, the, for there to be, a, for the existence of a problem. Okay. By the way, the, uh, the, the author, there are two papers, one on the CEO turnover and one on CEO pay relative to other high talented individuals. But the two papers by Steve Kaplan, they're still working papers, haven't been, haven't been um, uh, published yet. But really with updated data, and Steve Kaplan's one of the best uh, finance guys out there. Um, in corporate governance. Um, okay, private equity. Let's talk a little bit about private equity quickly. What is private equity? Uh, private equity are these partnerships that get established. Okay, they have a, a general partner who manages the business. They raise money from limited partners. And what private equity traditionally has done, and there are a number of forms of private equity. Venture capital is a form of private equity. In venture capital, they fund startups. They provide capital to entrepreneurs. They, they help the company grow, and then they, you know, they take the company pub, uh, public, or they, or they sell the company to another company, and they, they make money that way. Uh, most of the public private equity market is not in, in uh, venture capital, but what it does is it looks for businesses that it, they believe are either underperforming, usually private businesses, not public businesses, usually pri private businesses, that they believe are underperforming, or a family business where the family wants to get out of the business. Okay. Um, and they go and they buy that business, they bring in professional management, they improve it, and then they sell it. That's the typical model of private equity. Uh, leverage buyouts in the 80s, a lot of the hostile takeovers were done through private equity vehicles. Uh, KKR, which is a famous private equity firm, really did a lot of those hostile takeovers, including the largest, the largest ever, which was R.J. Reynolds, uh, R.J. Nabisco in, the, uh, in 1989. That was done by KKR. KKR is still around today. Um, what's happened in the last five years, and private equity has existed forever probably, but in its current form for at least the last 25 years. What's happened in the last five or so years is enormous amount of capital has flown into private equity. And just in the last two or three years, these private equity companies are taking over, not in a hostile way, but taking over huge public companies. They're making them private, i.e. they're buying up all the stock and they're making them private. And the big question is why? Why is this happening? Because it's, it's, it's a real economic phenomenon. This is not some trivial thing. We're talking about tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars, actually hundreds of billions of dollars if you include the debt, being allocated to taking public companies and turning them into private companies. And why is this happening? And I think it's happening because the cost of being public is so high. And the cost of being public is high because of regulation. A big factor here is Sarbanes-Oxley. Big factor. And that's why the timing of private equity's rise to where it is today is around 2002, 2003, when you get this wave. Sarbanes-Oxley makes it extraordinarily expensive to be a public company. All the accounting rules and the internal control mechanisms that Sarbanes forces, including the criminal liability that a CEO has when he signs off on the financials, and the board has an audit committee, it's just expensive. It's tens of millions. We said $1.5 trillion economy-wide. And their economies to getting rid of that cost. Instead of that cost going to the government or to going to accountants or going to all kinds of bureaucrats, now that cost can go into the pocket of the private equity guys. Okay. So there's a cost in taking that out. 
But there's another cost today of being a public company. And that's the hassle cost, the harassment cost, if you will. Um, you get rid of culpas. You don't have to deal with culpas. You don't have to do, deal with these union pension funds. You don't have to deal with these state treasurers who are coming knocking at your door and demanding that you be environmentally friendly or worker friendly or this friendly or Connecticut friendly or whatever friendly. You can run the business for the sake of its owners. And what's interesting here is that it doesn't really resolve this ownership and control issue. Because who controls the company? Well, this, the new CEO and the, and the general partner. But who really owns the company? The limited partner. And, who are the, and the limited partners, what control do they have over what the general partner does? Zero. None. They don't vote on anything. It's not, no democracy at all. You can't, they can't even sell, sell their shares like in a stock market. There's a complete separation of ownership and control in private equity, which nobody talks about. So why are people so confident that that's not a problem? Because of the way the general partner is compensated. He gets a fee, 2% on the money he manages, and 20% of the profits. So he's got an incentive to create profits. Yeah. It's not efficient to have a lot of small limited partners. So most of your limited partners, this is funny, but most of your limited partners are the same institutional investors that are harassing the corporations and now your limited partners. So Culpers is probably your limited partner. But they have no say as a limited partner where they do have a say as a shareholder. But it's the same people. And Kalpas and the institutional investors, the unions, are in, a, in, this, in this really difficult situation, right, supposedly, which is great. I love it when they get into difficult situations. <laughs> On the one hand, the shareholders, they're advocating for these things, which is pushing these companies into the hands of the private equity holders, where they are, <laughs> which is another basket of their funds. So within, they've got this conflict between the private equity arm and the public arm of Kalpas. And if all these companies become private, what's going to happen to the public equity arm all the wealth. I mean, it's, it's really interesting to, to see these guys twisting and turning and trying to figure out what to do. Set up a private equity structure that's just like a public company. And, um, In terms of getting small investors and yeah. then have trading? People are trying to do all kinds of stuff with that, and they've tried in the past. It, it, it might happen. Uh, but this is the point. I think with private equity, you have to take accredited investors, and that means certain net worth requirements and so on. Um, but, but what I find fascinating is nobody talks about separation of ownership control in private equity, and it exists. Um, because they've let, for now, they've left the market. Now, Congress is already talking about changing the tax laws to uh, cripple private equity. Uh, it's, it, it probably will happen. Uh, so they're starting to view this as a problem. And you can see it in the headlines of newspapers. Private equity does this, private equity does that, all with a very negative connotation and negative twist. But the private equity market is here to solve a problem. It's to get rid of regulatory costs and, and, and harassment by these politically motivated shareholders. Yeah. It's interesting how that uh, private equity regulation is going both ways. You know, Congress is saying, you know, the... Little investors, you know, it used to be we're trying to protect you through that accredited investor rule. Now they're saying the little guy doesn't have access to this good stuff. Yes. Yeah, now they're complaining because, the, pri because it's, the, pri the small investor can't get into the private equity world. And yet all the returns are supposed to be there. Now, I think there are going to be a lot of problems with private equity. Let me say that the, the real concerns, in my view, for private equity, I expect that I think there's going to be a crash down the road here. And I think the reason is this. These GPs are basically creating conglomerates. I'm not a big believer in conglomerates. I think it's hard enough to run one, one business well. They're basically creating, take Blackstone Group, which just bought Hilton. It was in the newspaper. They own Hilton. They own, they own the largest real estate company in some way. So those are somewhat related. But then they own manufacturing, and they own financial, and they, they own all these different industries. And I worry whether those GPs can actually manage all that. Now, what they do do is they find, just like Jack Walsh did, they find really high-quality CEOs to run each one of them. And what I find interesting is that people like Nardelli, who got kicked out of Home Depot, are finding jobs in private equity. And what really kills the whole CEO pay issue is that CEO pay packages being paid by private equity firms are higher, significantly higher, than CEO pay packages in the public corporations. By that measure, CEOs in public companies are underpaid, not overpaid.
They're underpaid. And indeed, what's happening is you're seeing the best CEOs leave public corporations and going work for private equity. And I know at least one, one CEO who's, who's done that. You know, it's not worth it. And the CEOs say, why do you do it? Pays better. We don't get harassed by shareholders. That's it. Yeah, quickly. Are those packages publicized then? If they're in private? You can, you can get them. How do you find that? You can get them. Uh, uh, you know, if you have a relationship with Culpers and so on, you can, you can find this stuff. Because the limited partners find out. And some of them are advertised. Um, okay, let me quickly, what do we got? Five minutes. So let me quickly tell, say something about the future. Um, future that is going to happen without objectivism, the future that would, I think, happen in a free market. Uh, I think this, you know, we're looking at real problems with, without a change. Uh, running a company becomes more and more political. Boards of directors become more and more compliance boards, less and less focus on making money and more and more focus on appeasing regulators. Private equity may be flourishing for a while as a solution, but creating its own set of problems. And no flexibility in financial markets to resolve whatever problems are created because regulations have sucked out that flexibility. Uh, we could, we could and I don't want to predict this, but we could see a situation similar to Japan in the 1990s where we know what needs to be done. We know American business needs to be structured and how you would do it, but you don't have the tools because the regulators have taken those tools away. Now, Americans are incredibly innovative in the face of regulation, but I think there's a limit to how innovative you can be in the face of those regulations, and at some point, this could crack. On the other hand, in a truly free market, as I've tried to hint, I don't know exactly what would happen. I think that you would have some companies with concentrated ownership, with block holders, You'd have other companies with dis dispersed ownership. I think you might find new forms of governance. You, I mean, there are a lot of things that might happen if you took out the whole regulatory mechanisms, whether insider trading is allowed or not, you know, how the exchanges behave, because exchanges now become, instead of the SEC becoming now the facilitators of a lot of stuff, it's private exchanges that become facilitators of a lot of, a lot of these things, what they would actually look like and how they would evolve. Um, what I can guarantee, though, is that in a free market, if corporations and businessmen are left alone, productivity would increase dramatically. That the level, the standard of living, the, 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 the quantity of material wealth that is available to us, and as a consequence, the quantity of spiritual wealth that was available to us, would grow exponentially from where we are today. Uh, and the sky is not the limit in this case. There is no limit uh, to where that can go. Uh, freedom, it, it, it is really, I mean, it's unfortunate to some extent. It's hard to imagine <laughs> the kind of creativity that can be born uh, through freedom. Uh, but what we do know is that lack of freedom, particularly as it increases, as it grows, as, as, the, as the regulatory environment, can only lead to disaster. It cannot lead to a positive outcome. So in spite of the fact that things look good, economy keeps growing, technology keeps improving, if there is no change in the culture, that can't continue indefinitely. That will have to come crashing down one of these days. And I'm not in the business of predicting when. And, and I think it takes a long time, generally, be, in the face of American ingenuity and ways, creative ways to go around regulations and so on. I think it takes a long time. But it has to happen at some point. Uh, you know, A is A. Uh, if you put businessmen in shackles, which is what regulations are doing, at some point they will be either they they won't maybe they won't go on strike, but it'll be the equivalent of them going on strike because they won't be able to produce. And on that depressing note, <laughs> thank you all. All material in this program is protected by copyright and may not be reproduced in any form or manner, nor played before a live audience, without the express written permission of the producer, the Ayn Rand Institute. For further information, or to order other products, please visit eStore.AynRand.org or call one 800 729 6149
They say soccer is the football of the rest of the world. Only soccer's championship lasts an entire month. Now we're talking. And there's no better place to spend that month than at Buffalo Wild Wings. Get into B-Dubs where we've got match day select domestic beer specials and a special sauce mashup to go along with our already loaded roster of 21 sauces and seasonings. That's enough combinations for a full month's worth of delicious cheering. Catch all the soccer action at Buffalo Wild Wings. Wings, beer, sports. Offers vary by location. 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 By location.